we came to the conclusion that the shale gas is not the issue here. It's the fracking that's the issue. I think shale gas is natural gas. It's the technology and the methodology and how this gas is extract, extracted from, from, from the ground. So we've asked for a moratorium. The official opposition is asking for a moratorium for many reasons. We have concern about fracking, serious concerns about fracking. We also still don't understand what is the real economic potential if there is. He got back to quite right there. We still don't know that. We still don't know how many jobs, if any, would be created around this. We still don't know how many or what kind of financial impact this would have on the provincial coffers in terms of royalty. Check any community where they did. I, 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 I get you. And one thing is for sure too, <coughs> is the value of shale gas today is going down. So to be able to meet some of the numbers that the government has put forward, you would have to have a lot of, a lot of um, drilling <laughs> and fracking. So we've asked for more to let's relax on this issue because it's so fundamental. Let's focus on job sectors that are growing, that can grow, and that are safe. In the midst of Blackville, with all the signs up, about 10% of the audience, very vocal 10%, about 10% of the audience was pro shale gas. They left after that hour of the presentation, and the rest of the people, 60 or 70 people, stayed there for another two hours to talk about it. So there's a common misconception here that just because a lot of loud people are saying, yes, we want it, that's not necessarily indicative of the entire population. But as I've went around to these various communities around the, uh, uh, lately they've been asking me to not just talk about shale gas, but they've been asking me to talk about New Brunswick energy policy and jobs and also climate change, which are things that you know, haven't been associated <laughs> Now, now, governments in the past have used energy and, and jobs creation as sort of the hand in hand, whether it's going to be, you know, NB Power is going to solve it, or it's going to be shale gas, or now we're talking about bringing a pipeline in with, the, with Alberta tar sands. Now, when you talk to these people and you find out that they're just learning that climate change is really serious, I mean, you might not know it when reading the Irving papers, but if you see anything else going on in the world, it's the number one problem, not just from scientists, but people from the World Bank and, and military installations in the, in the world and the CIA are all saying, this is the foremost problem in the world. And they want to know what's happening that. And then I tell them that shale gas and tar sands are the two worst, with the exception of coal, the two worst uh, uh, sources of energy in terms of climate change. So uh, they start connecting these dots. And then we talk about jobs. And I show them a chart for many economic uh, uh, sources, the economic study that shows how many jobs are created in the energy field for every million dollars you invest. At the very bottom, the shale gas, the natural gas. You start one of the things to like solar and wind and retrofitting our infrastructure, you're creating four or five times as many jobs. Okay? And then the last thing I want to say about that is that so you, so you have the job creation. And these are all renewable. And then you look at the news just today, because I read the latest research, just today two reports come out, and about the, the, the uh, solar, amount of solar power in the world today has reached an all-time high. It's all being done without subsidies now. The same with wind. And the countries that are doing this are prospering. My question is, and comments are kind of similar to Jen, so they can be answered together. Um, I'm 30 and I want to stay in New Brunswick. Um, I have three younger brothers who all want to stay here. None of them are very interested in working in fields, including myself, working in fields where we are digging holes in the ground or pumping oil out of the earth. Um, there are, I think, higher expectations for the types of jobs that young people want to have in New Brunswick. Um, and that they want to contribute, we want to contribute positively to our communities and to societies and have jobs where we bring our communities together and provide solutions to some of the problems that we've created in the past, not continue to create, to have our jobs create more problems for somebody else to fix later. We want to have jobs that contribute to a healthy community, healthy people that have bring long-term solutions to 
maintaining uh, resources and money in our communities. And I cringe at the fact that the, the idea that we want to create a, a hub of, of training miners to send around the world. That's one of the most destructive industries in the world. my personal career to leave behind for the community where I want, that where I've grown up and want to stay, my province, my country. It's not the legacy uh, that I, I want to see the province leave, uh, our communities leave. So kind of on the same vein, I'd really like to see some like quick, uh, quick hot um, answers on what some of those alternatives are, and we started to talk about them, but jobs that where progressive-minded youth want to stay in Brunswick, I, I think that if you looked at those migration numbers uh, to other places, you would see a lot of uh, highly educated youth where there are no opportunities in New Brunswick. They're heading to BC, to Ontario, to other countries where they can deploy their, their brains in, in generating progressive ideas to solve, uh, uh, solve problems, not create new ones. So I would like to see some comments on, on that. We talk about the blame. We are to blame as individuals. We've allowed the, the someone to take the, the reins from us. We did nothing about it. We have to empower communities to say, this is what I want, not what you're going to give me. Like the other night, Led uh, showed up the 25,000 from the government to give the library. We are like, like, we were hens in the coop, sprinkling the ground. If we accept that and do nothing about it, Damn it! We're going to you're going to get everything they give to us for nothing. We actually proposed the Liberal did in the legislature an amendment to the legislation to authorize local service district in a public meeting to vote for or against development of shale gas within their territory. And the Conservative MLAs, all of them, voted against it. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, on your point uh, about not everyone wanting or, or perhaps anyone wanting in your family uh, a job that involved uh, any type of natural resource extraction. No, no, that's not what I said. All right. Not all natural resource extraction is... All right, fair, fair enough. Fair enough, you were talking more about petroleum. Healthy right? jobs. Yes. Healthy jobs. So I, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about... Uh, a healthy, uh, healthy company, healthy jobs that 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 we as the government have invested in. And uh, if you travel along Queen Street in Fredericton, you'll find uh, a company by the name of Lumen Ultra. And and one of the services that they provide are uh, environmentally friendly ways to treat uh, municipal wastewater. So that's, that's, that's a component of the bioscience sector that, that, that we as a government feel is important and have invested in. And that little company has, has done very well and gets stronger and has more companies and employs more New Brunswickers each and every year for an environmentally healthy and environmentally sustainable activity. Uh, getting to, to, uh, to, to Jim's point, and, and I believe uh, David made this point as well, talking about the, the energy policy of, of NB Power and the, uh, the, the, the mix of energy generating resources that we have. Uh, Bell Dune and, and Colson Cove, which, which burn in effect Bunker C, are the two very last energy generation stations to come online when, when power is needed. They spend most of the year uh, not operating and, and only come on as, as, a, as a, a peak power supplier. In addition to that, uh, NB Coal, which, which had the distinction of having some of the, uh, the highest sulfur content coal in the world, ha has been uh, decommissioned as well. Just a, a little correction there. Kurt Beldoon actually operates as often as they can run it. And in fact, my <laughs> colleague, Mr. Volpe, uh, when he was doing the consultations on the energy policy, said to me how terrible it was when they had to turn down Beldoon in the summertime because there's too much wind generating electricity on the MB power system. <laughs> that was a negative. Um, That's not a fair comment. No, it is a fair comment. No, Absolutely it is. 
you're, you're absolutely right about Colson Cove, but it doesn't get used much anymore because it's oil. It costs too, way too much, but coal is cheap the way it is right now. Um, two things I want to say to a couple of comments. One is, first, we need our government to do no harm. Right? To do no harm. We've got... I was in a meeting some a while back where, where a deputy minister explained that yes, it was true. When the mills closed up north, they took the allocation of that wood and flooded the market. Um, for wood, with public wood, with the remaining companies, so the private wood lotters no longer <coughs> can sell into the into the market. Destroy the livelihoods of private wood lot owners. A contractor in our area, a good good contractor, well respected, not kind of a cut and run kind of guy, and he therefore had no business, had to shut down his equipment, sell it, and go out west. Not his choice. He had a perfectly good business as a logging contractor in southwestern New Brunswick. And because of that decision to destroy the market for private wood in this province with crown wood, when the mills closed up north, giving to the remaining mills, thrown out of business, had to go west. Do no harm on, on the environment. Government has a green building policy. It's beautiful. Top notch in the country. Build green buildings, small environmental footprint, cheap to run, year in, year out, year in, year out into the future. What have they done? They're exempting buildings that come forward when they're to be built from the green energy, uh, from the green building policy. Because why? Because the capital cost is a little higher, the operating costs um, are, are lower. So they reversed and said, we don't want to spend, spend that capital cost, we're going to suck up the annual uh, higher uh, operating costs for the foreseeable future. It doesn't make any sense. Exempting new buildings that are being constructed for the government from their green po building policy. So do no harm. That's the first one. And then the other is, uh, communities need tools to develop their economy. One of the things that the rural municipality of Upper Miramichi here had a great idea, because they've got about 10,000 hectares of forest within their, uh, within their municipal boundaries now, to say, why can't we use that forest to create jobs in the community, both with the timber and with non-timber forest products, and do it in a way that we, that, that we feel is better for the environment, is better for the animals, better for the water, better for the plants, not relying all, on, on all this clear cutting. They went to government, got nowhere. Nowhere. Why? Because the Crown lands are licensed to large companies, to Irving principally, and they don't, you know, the, the, the direction always says when people come with these proposals, government, go talk to the licensee. Right, that's fair. Dear Mr. Irving, would you please give up some of the land that's licensed to you so that we can make, make a living in our community? It's not going to happen. So do no harm and tools for the community. So those are the two things. Part of the job of a provincial government is to make choices and to decide that based on all the evidence, <coughs> this is the direction that we're going to try and take our province for the following reasons, to be as open and transparent about that as possible. And it's that approach, I think, which we should, I hope that citizens will come more and more to expect from their politicians, that we'd follow the example of some of the American states where you can look at every single penny that's spent by the government. I guess I can't say penny anymore. Nickel. <laughs> that's spent by governments. And you can see exactly where it's spent, and you can provide feedback on whether you think that's a stupid waste of money, or you think there should be more spent on this idea. This is a, an increasingly common idea. Still not very common here. And, a link, and just to, I know that uh, David was making some points that, at Kurt's expense, I'll make one at Rogers. It's very, it's easy to talk about the Liberal Party's record in government, but it's worth remembering that it was the Liberal government that signed the leases yes. Yes. for shale gas exactly. in the province. And linking back to a point I was making earlier, I'm sure it is a complete coincidence that there was about $25,000 in corporate contributions from shale gas companies while the Liberal government was in office between 2006 and 2010, which dropped to zero in 2011 when they were out of government. And I would wonder what it would be if we had the misfortune to elect another liberal government, what it would go back up to again. So it's the links, in, the links between financing of parties and transparency, I think, are things that we should be talking about. On Stephanie's point about what can, we do, what can we do, short and dirty, points about how we can make this province work for progressive young people or any sort of young people, give the power back to the communities. We are the only province in the country where, again, we've got unelected local governments. We don't have the ability at the local level to make any decisions at all. Chris is a councillor in Minto. I was talking to the town manager up in Woodstock, who's a friend of mine, and he was saying that every time his council, they approve a, a law to change this, uh, a street light or a crossing guard, 
a crossing sign on the street corner. They have to get a minister, a ministerial letter signed by Minister Fitch in Fredericton. And that applies to every single municipality across the province. So no wonder the, the energy and creativity of municipalities is being stifled because there's these layers of useless bureaucracy. And so when I hear David talking about creation, creating a ministry for rural development and other people talking about other ministries and commissions and plans, we don't need more bureaucracy in this province. We need more power delegated back to the people with a flexible, efficient, government run in the best interest of the province to run healthcare, education, the court systems and infrastructure. Let people decide what they want to do. This is not rocket science. It's why some countries in the world have gotten incredibly rich very quickly and why we continue to sit around and argue about whether we should have another ministry panel to discuss the recommendations of the advisory council on the report of the da 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 da. It goes on and on and on. So let's stop it with the extra bureaucracy and actually just let people make decisions for themselves. That is supposed to be what a democracy is ultimately all about. There's no question that in New Brunswick the rights and the voice of everyday people, you know, like, like us, is being taken away. When you look at the uh, uh, recent regional service commission that has been set forth, what the provincial government has done is essentially unloaded the burden uh, or, or the political fallout that could be, be had to another layer of bureaucracy which your tax dollars are paying for. And I know this isn't quite in the question, but I'll get there. What we need in New Brunswick is more of a local approach, more of an approach again on small and medium sized business and that's why at the very beginning our opening statement was on uh, solar energy and real incentive, real incentive for homeowners to install solar energy. As someone who um, has seen a lot of um, young people uh, leave this province and as someone who has talked to um, people at university um, who are desperately worried about climate change, about the failure of this province to embrace green economy, when they can see jurisdictions elsewhere in this uh, country, in the U.S., and especially in Europe, that are thriving. And uh, my question to, I, I'm struck tonight by, by the, uh, the disparate um, ideology uh, in this forum. There seems to be a clear split between the Liberals and the, the PCs who still favor this outdated ideology of neoliberalism. And then on, um, you know, David Kuhn, Dominic Cardi, and Chris Austin are embracing the green economy and giving hope to the young people and to people like myself that they can still believe in this province. And so my question tonight is, will um, the two um, parties, is there hope for the PCs and the Liberals to show New Brunswickers that um, the neoliberalism ideology, the lies that we have been served time and time again and continue to be served by both the PCs and Liberals, will stop? And um, the facts are, more of us with fracking and other issues have become armed with the knowledge, with the facts from other jurisdictions. <laughs> and, and some of the lies um, that have been uh, spoken to us, we know otherwise. The facts are, and I just want to highlight very quickly four, the most um, <coughs> local community jobs and the most labor jobs are created by the green economy. Two, the most revenue generated by resource development is that owned by the government and controlled by the government. Three, the states and countries with the most strict environmental laws are the ones with the highest GDPs and the lowest unemployment rates. This rhetoric about balance between environment and the economy is a ruse and more people in this province know that. Yeah, and, <laughs> but certainly not least, and I counter Steph and I support Stephanie Merrill's notion that people do not want to be involved in digging holes in the ground that are going to lead us on a on a straightforward projection to catastrophic climate change. The fact is that MIT's think tank in December of 2012, released a report saying 
20% of our GDP worldwide is going to be consumed by catastrophic climate change um, by 2020, and, by, and most economic think tanks by 2030 are forecasting complete global economic meltdown if we don't address climate change now. So my question simply is when will the PCs and the Liberals end their ideological lies and start telling New Brunswickers the truth? I'm retired, I can say what I'd like to <laughs> And it's time for me to say, and I know there's teachers who are still teaching who would be mad that I, I'm saying this, but I'm saying it. This is the way it was. It was a dumping ground, and we worked like crazy. We had children that were sexually abused. I taught in two very disadvantaged schools in this and near the Fredericton area. We had children that were sexually abused. We had children that were drug, alcohol and drug problems in their family. We had to address all those problems. We had to, and then inclusion came in. The government said, oh, the, this province has inclusion, the, one of the best in Canada. But they brought it in with very little money. And of course, they were all dumped in there with beds and everything. We, people had to deal with people with catheters and everything. It was crazy. Crazy. That's why the literacy rate has gone down. Mr. Carty also raised the issue of uh, uh, there not being any tax incentives for cooperative businesses in the province as there, as there, as there is for small businesses. So um, I guess I, just out of curiosity, what, what strikes me about this is that does, does this, it seems to imply that perhaps historically there's antagonism to the cooperative movement in New Brunswick. So if anybody could illuminate uh, that, uh, speak to that issue, I, I'd appreciate knowing that. The major question is public debt. And if public debt won't be fixed, all these questions that you hear today, they won't work. The public debt will drag you down completely to zero. So you have to fix the public debt. This province, I believe, has uh, 10 billion officially. What is unofficial, which I believe is more, but nobody knows exactly how much. Plus 300 million interest growing. This population here is no way, no way they're going to cover it up. So this is question. If you will be in debt, you are slave to debtor. Are you going to pay? Are your taxes go higher? Are you lease everything? Well, I think we've got to find the problems to begin with. I think second to that, um, taxes have got to be according, in my opinion, to wealth. And that's why I personally believe that the higher uh, income uh, brackets should be taxed a little bit higher. Um, and I know, you know some people say, well, that's, that's easy to say. Well, it is easy to say. Some of these things, you know, here's what bothers me. As, as someone who's outside the legislature, who says things that I'm told are easy to say, well then if they're easy to say, why aren't you folks saying it? Why aren't you saying things like free vote? Why aren't you saying things like, and I'm talking to the, to the major traditional parties here, uh, things like uh, you know, higher taxes for uh, higher income earners, uh, things like uh, uh, you know, environmentally friendly programs that can help uh, stimulate the economy. And, and th there's so many things that need to change on a fundamental le uh, level within the government and politics. That's, that's the key. And that's why as a party, we stand on the very basics of free vote, we stand on the basics of true accountability, not the rhetoric of accountability, and real transparency by giving uh, the Auditor General more authority and more of a mandate to really look at the books, how did we uh, get to this problem, and then we can start looking at solutions and how to fix it. The founder of my party, Tommy Douglas, said that uh, you never ever want to be in debt to the bankers because their interests are not our interests. So this idea that somehow it's more left-wing to be 
fiscally responsible, uh, right wing rather, to be fiscally responsible is, is ludicrous. And we've been proving that year after year, sad election after sad election in New Brunswick. <laughs> As uh, I appreciate that, uh, that Roger was the only Liberal MLA who wasn't part of the last government, but so, uh, both uh, he and Kirk and I, their governments have talked about sharing the wealth. What have they actually done? Cut corporate taxes, cut personal income taxes for the wealthiest. There have been some other good programs, like the poverty reduction program, absolutely. There's, there's some good that goes along with the bad, but the general approach is wrong. And I don't think it's because the Liberals or Tories are bad people, it's because they're not putting enough time and effort into making sure they think these policies through enough. And they're paying too much attention to people who they shouldn't be and not enough attention to the voters because, unfortunately, we've made it easy for them. On the cooperatives, I think there has been an antipathy here that there was a strong co-op movement in Nova Scotia. It doesn't seem to have really been, ever had the same roots set in New Brunswick. Uh, David pointed out that there is, a, there is the Co-ops Act from 1976. What we don't have in New Brunswick is anything, as someone <coughs> mentioned earlier, about the, uh, the protections and so on that most co-ops get in terms of being distinct entities, the tax protection. The, the law sort of frame, legal framework that would help to encourage the development of co-ops. On literacy rates, I think some of the misguided efforts to make our system better without sufficient funding have contributed to making uh, the literacy rates certainly not as high as they should be. And that's something else we have got to look at. As in healthcare, as in education, the focus has to be on students and patients rather than looking first at infrastructure, first at teachers, doctors, or nurses, Everything has got to be focused on care for the citizen. And we fo focus too much on the other side because there is no patient's union. There is no student's union. Parents' unions, parent-teacher associations are divided up across the, the province into the different schools. So how can we help to balance that? Again, back to local control. Give local communities more control over their schools and their hospitals within strong provincial frameworks to make sure that no kid gets left behind, that every, every uh, hospital and health center is run to a high standard, but give more local control. And uh, on Mark's point about uh, when the liberals and conservatives are going to decide that uh, they're giving up on neoliberalism, just reminds me of a joke that I tell to the press when they say, are you worried about splitting the vote? Because the NDP is going up a lot in the polls. And, they're worried that the liberals might suffer from this. And I said, well, it does. It keeps me awake at night. The thought that all those liberals and Tories out there just splitting that right wing votes, uh, yeah, it's something that really worries me. But from my side, I'm just going to keep on working in the center left in politics where I think 90% of New Brunswickers are and offer a real governing alternative for 2014. When I, when I first got elected, I was quite concerned about this whole issue of, of literacy because it's so fundamental. And I, I started going around to the groups who are working in that area to try and understand why we've heard so much talk about literacy and about all these programs supposedly and so on for so long, yet the problem doesn't seem to be getting resolved in any way. And, and you spoke to it. Um, you, you know, one of the things that happened in fact was uh, one of the first groups I, I, I was, it was suggested I go talk to said, we can't talk to you because, because we're concerned we lose our funding. We only talk to the party that's in power. So. <laughs> There's a lot of fear in this province that is, that is also part of our problem here. But I wanted to say that, that you know, it takes me back to when, when Frank McKenna said uh, the last time we had a big debt and deficit that uh, people first ended when the money ran out. And that was a chilling thing at the time for me to, to hear him say. And I think that that attitude has pervaded, um, uh, pervaded government uh, ever since. And uh, th that, that speaks really to why we have these situations like has happened in the education system, um, where we really have had a whole line of series of governments who have been focused just on bean counting and not on people. And that's got to change. On the topic of literacy, there's, there's a very interesting project going on on the Keswick right now. And, and the Keswick has one of the uh, highest uh, rates of illiteracy in in the in the area, and, and so the way the teachers and the community uh, address that issue is, is they had a number of seniors in the area uh, write down their stories, and it was a class project, and the, the the children interviewed the seniors, and it was a way of capturing the stories from a region and, and uh, publishing the book, and the students were more inclined to read because it was something that they were involved in. It was a story that they helped write. It was a story that they helped publish. In many cases, it was a, 
uh, a family member or neighbor that had provided them the story. And, and uh, that, that initiative uh, has been growing around the riding in the last little while. So I, I, I throw that out there as uh, an opportunity for, for something low cost, <coughs> high impact, that can capture the stories of our seniors and at the same time create an interest level among our young people to learn how to, uh, to, to read. Uh, on the topic of the small business, New Brunswick Small Business Investor Tax Credit, that was something that was brought up. It, it's the New Brunswick Small Business Investor Tax Credit. It doesn't mean that it's against the co-op movement, but it was originally designed for small business. The, 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 the government, past and present, certainly have nothing against the co-op movement. In fact, if Co-op Atlantic were, were questioned, I think they would tell you that uh, had the government uh, of Bernard Lord not intervened in 2005, there probably wouldn't be a Co-op Atlantic uh, movement in the province at all today. So we're most definitely not against the Co-op movement. On the, uh, on the topic of, of uh, environmental work and, and when will different parties uh, act upon uh, environmental concerns and things of that nature. I, I stand on my record. You could purchase a house in the United States without having to demonstrate that you could service the debt after you'd purchased it. And that created a housing bubble that unfortunately dragged Canada right down along with it, and New Brunswick in particular, because of our high uh, dependence on, on exports to the, the US. So, so that has caused the public debt to grow. And as I said early on in the conversation, um, you know, if you're looking to balance the books, you, 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 can, you can trim expenses or you can grow revenues. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've, we've trimmed the, the debt, the, the, the expenses significantly, and, and we are looking at, at opportunities to uh, grow revenue and everything is on the table. That's, that's including uh, uh, tax increases to, to wealthy New Brunswickers and including tax increases to, to, to business. Yes, even the, even the evil demonized conservative party <laughs> is looking at the prospect of, of actually raising taxes on, on business. One of the biggest pressure that we have put in onto our teachers is the fact that we have inclusiveness is good in our classroom, but we didn't we didn't historically provide enough support to our kids in the classroom and indirectly our teachers. You know, there's a lot of pressure in a classroom. I actually spent a full day <coughs> last year in a classroom, and and it's uh, it's quite interesting. It's not like the days when I was in school. And uh, we got to give respect to our teachers in New Brunswick. They, they work mile really hard. <laughs> Sorry? Walk a mile there you go. I really appreciate what you guys do and what you've done. And government, if they're going to make policy decisions like they've, they've done historically, the resources needs to be, uh, needs to come with it. And one thing that we've said and many people have said and will be said again, the best investment we can do is in our kids for the long term. Can't forget our seniors, but for the long term in regards to, um, to the prosperity of New Brunswick. So I really share what you said uh, tonight, and uh, it is something that we want to focus on because uh, when I did my campaign in 2008, my own riding, I've met a lot of teachers, I've met a lot of parents also who's got kids that's got learning challenges that needs to have the appropriate services and resources to help them. And uh, so it's, it's a very important issue, and, I, and, and again, I share that, and it needs to be a priority again to be able to offer the right services in the classroom. Because in a classroom today, it's not only about learning, there's all kinds of other stuff that happens. And a teacher uh, cannot, uh, all due respect, uh, handle all of these different issues that's, that they're facing. And now my pension's going to be cut. I heard. 32 years. I heard. I work like a dog. Yeah. And now my pension's going to be cut. There'll be questions in the house. Thank I can tell you, you, Conservative Party.
A debt is not always a problem when you have the capacity to pay it or to reimburse it. What we need to do in New Brunswick is to increase our ability and capacity not only to pay our bills, but to sustain our programs because we need to invest in social programs, education and healthcare. So that's why we've been saying at the Liberal Party for two and a half years, and historically, the Liberal Party has focused on job and the economy. We have. There's a record. There's some success stories, and there's been some failures. But we have focused on job creation. And we need to increase our wealth and our capacity to pay our bills and to be able to sustain our programs and at times invest even more in some of our programs that we need. So for me, the debt is a big concern. For our, our party, the debt is a big concern. But we cannot, and I said that earlier, we cannot cut our way to pros prosperity. There needs to be some investments too with a return on those investments for taxpayers. I think we all want, including myself and the Liberal Party, want to improve New Brunswick. And we want to improve the status and the quality of life of all of you. Now, it's, it's, it's words. I, I get it. But if we plan it right, and we engage you people like we're doing tonight, and we come up, come up with a real job creation plan for New Brunswick, I think we can do it. It's going to be hard work. No doubt. There's going to be some sacrifices. No doubt. But if we do it for the right reason, if we do it for the right reason, I think we can do it. We're all here tonight, whether we travel the short distance or a long distance, because we care about New Brunswick. The people across this table care about New Brunswick, and all of you are here because you care about New Brunswick. We certainly didn't agree on everything that was talked about tonight. But people fought and died so that we could come together in a room like we did tonight and voice our opinions without a fear of any type of, of political repercussion. And for that reason, we still live in the greatest country in the world. I just want to say that the good news is um, I'm touring the province right now and I'm visiting businesses and co-ops and social enterprises. The good news is that the seeds of the new economy are already growing in New Brunswick. They just need water and light and some cultivation to, to blossom out. Uh, from Spearville Mill uh, in near Woodstock, which is providing markets for farmers who are producing grain organically locally uh, and shipping to the Atlantic uh, market. Um, which is a co-op and actually the guy who was the CEO now came back from Alberta to take over the mill, run that co-op. And uh, geo, geo, geothermal, uh, uh, geothermal, maritime geothermal, who's manufacturing green technologies, the biggest in the country, right in Petakodiak, New Brunswick, that uses geo energy, geothermal energy to heat buildings and it's being used in, in New Brunswick, in Quebec uh, and across uh, Atlantic Canada. Phenomenal. No one seems to know about it and in fact I was told I was the first political uh, party leader that had ever visited the, the manufacturing plant, so I don't know what that says, but anyway, I found it, maybe that was it. Uh, so that's the good news, and we just need, what we need to do is have, uh, have uh, new voices in the legislature to uh, champion uh, what, we, what is happening and to help shine the light on that, to help make sure it gets watered and cultivated and we we grow in, in a new direction. And Roger said, you know, for the last two and a half years, we've been focusing on job creation. What's, what's changed in the Liberal Party in the last two, two and a half years? They've been in opposition. And in opposition, the Liberal Party and the Tories were the same before, are always focusing on the issues that most people care about. The problem is when they get into government, and Roger was talking about how the Liberal Party should be a party that positions itself in the center left. A lot of center left Liberals have left the Liberals and joined the NDP recently. And I've heard from a number of people who were in the last caucus, not from Kelly Lamrock, our most prominent defector, but from others, so I can say this without revealing my source, that the first day of that caucus meeting in 2006, the MLA sat down and were told by someone who had not been elected, who was not the premier, that your job is to go out and get reelected. Our job is to run the government. And that sets up a whole train of terrible consequences because when the politicians feel they don't actually have the power, 
Then they go out and they try and just, as we talked about this evening in many different occasions, buy your votes, essentially with projects big and small, good and bad. Lots of those projects have ended up being not bad at all and have helped the province. Lots of them, like Atcon, have been utter disasters, or Emulsion, another huge disaster, to, make, to give one Liberal and one Tory example. That has, stuff has got to stop. And that can only stop when we have a party in government that isn't controlled by a backroom of people, isn't controlled by people with, who are being told what to do by either corporations, by trade unions, by people who've been members or leaders of the party for de decades and decades, by perhaps former premiers who left office a long time ago whose first names start with F. Who have, I mean, people, there, there's a small group of people in this province who controlled it for 150 years, and they have not been governing in your best interest or mine, or even in the best interest of most of the MLAs and the people at this table, who I know are, are exactly as they say they are, people who are in this to try and change the province. Being a new party, our biggest struggle is just letting people know what we stand for and what we're all about. I want to be very clear tonight that the People's Alliance was built for the sole purpose of actually changing the system of politics and government. Kirk said it best. People run for office to do good. I don't believe they have bad intentions. But the reality is, when they get in, they have no choice. And until we reform the system to allow MLAs to represent us once again, you once again, we're going to continue down this road of a form of dictatorship. Um, our party stands for MLAs representing constituents over party leader, and we've taken examples like Wilson and Tate, who asked a very uh, important question in the leg legislature and was forced to apologize. No MLA should ever be forced to apologize for asking any question in a democratic legislature. That, that's, that's, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. That's number one. Stuart Jameson, who questioned the sale of MB Power, he was booted. Jim Parrott, who questioned the cost of duality in healthcare and why we have du two healthcare systems in the province of New Brunswick, he gets booted. So it's not the issues of fracking and NB power, because tomorrow there'll be another issue. It's the issue of the system that has got to change. Here, 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 and, here. and I just want to encourage you. Uh, you know, we're gaining support on a regular basis, and I can say that sincerely. We are getting calls constantly from people that see where we're coming from, that we're not out in left field. We're bringing a very common sense approach to politics and government. We're taking very balanced policies and things that just can work better, that we know can work better. And so that when you get good guys that, that get elected, they can do what their constituents want them to do and have asked them to do by the vote in the ballot box. I made the very self-serving comment earlier that we've got to think of our seniors not as a burden but as a source of wealth. We've got to think of our rural communities, unlike Don Mills from Corporate Research Associates a month or so ago, who basically said our rural communities are a burden on us. To see our rural communities and the things we do here, the traditions we have as a source of wealth. I'm going to throw in one last bit of information. Something I just learned in the last 48 hours. Don't know why I never heard it before. It causes me great shame as a New Brunswicker. I was told that seven of the ten poorest postal codes in Canada are in New Brunswick, and all seven of them are First Nations communities. Now, I'm thinking of these communities as a source of wealth, the tradition, the cultural traditions that they have that could be part of this discussion. 